good stuff, amen? To me, that's a beautiful picture of the love of God that reaches in right where we are and, and just changes us and transforms us. And, and we've all got our stuff. We've all made our mistakes. How many of you guys have made a mistake in here? <laughs> yeah. I think we all have, right? Yeah, like this morning, like, you know, 10 minutes ago or whatever. We all have this stuff called sin in our life. No one is better than the other person. And Scripture says that God looks at everybody the same. He doesn't look at some over another and some are taller. Or some have more money because they're looked at better by God. No, nope, that's not how it works. In fact, Scripture says that man looks at the outward appearance, but what does God look at? The heart. That's right. God looks at the heart. And, and so um, God has got a plan for you and I. Once we come to know Christ and that transformation happens and he deals with our sin, he cleans you up. That's not your job to clean up. I mean, yes, we want to be good. We want to obey God. But it's really God's job to clean you up because Jesus is the only soap that will clean you. Amen? That's the way it is, guys. Um, and so once we have stepped out of sin, it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, but we're stepping away from sin. We're doing a U-turn. Repentance means doing a U-turn away from sin. When we're doing that, God gives us grace to get out of that briar patch called sin. And then God starts to transform us. I want to begin this morning with a question along those lines, and, and that is this. What would it look like in your life? Just think about your life. Think about your routine. What would it look like in your life if God started doing things in your life that only God could do in radical fashion? Huge things that you've never experienced before. You know, think about people in Scripture that God did amazing things with in the Bible. Stuff that people can't explain, that logic does, it doesn't make sense. It seems impossible to the world. What if that was you? What if you woke up tomorrow morning and you were that action figure of the living God that God started to use and started to change and started to do things in your life? And, and the reason why I ask you that question is because that's what God wants from you. That's what God wants from me. And it's not that we can make it happen, but we can be a part and partner with God to let God do God-sized things in our world. That's the name of our latest sermon series, God-sized. Because the longer I know God, the more that I'm realizing that He wants to raise our human sights. You know, you've been looking at one thing, and God says, I want you to look higher. I want you to look bigger. I want you to look deeper. I want you to look stronger. I want you to look no longer man-sized or woman-sized. I want you to start looking at your life through my lens of God doing things in your life that only I can do, God-sized things. Because if you and I do this right as Christ followers, living in God's Holy Spirit power, if we get infused by the power of God and God starts to, to take over our lives the way He wants to, then the world around us is going to take notice. And they're going to see that you're doing things that don't make sense, things that only God can do, and God's going to get the glory. Because when they look at you, they're going to see more than just you. And that's really the plan, amen? That's it, guys. That's what we're created to do. And that's really our human purpose, to bear God's image to those on your street. And as I've shared before, if your neighbor wants to know if God is real, they have to go no further than your front door. Because that's your job, and that's my job, to show the world that God is real through our life. Once again, that doesn't mean we're perfect, but it means that there's something different about us. And that thing that's different is the Holy Spirit power of God operating in our life. Jesus said this in John 10, 10. He said he, he came to give us not just life, but over-the-top life, abundant life, life to the fullest. That's your and my goal, to partner with God to let him do that. And, and this message is life-changing because it gives you and I a new way to be human. Not like everybody else has done it, but a new way, radically new way, so that miracles happen in our wake. Things happen that we can't explain. And that's really what Jesus was describing in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when he said, you'll be my witnesses when you receive my power, the Holy Spirit, and then you'll do God-sized things. And, and last week we started looking at how this happens. Okay, now what, if that's what God's called us to, to do God-sized things, how do we get there? How, how does this happen in your life, in my life? And that's really what I want to be talking about today because we realize that one of the things, one of the first things that we need to do to, to live into this God-sized goal that we share is that we need to stop drinking from the wrong well. Can I get an amen? We need to stop drinking from the, the wrong well. 
And, and please let me explain. We talked about last week that Jeremiah 2.13, the, the prophet, it's kind of like he blew the whistle and threw the flag on the field of life and said, hold on, time out. You guys, Israel, you're missing it. You're missing it. And he said this to the people of Israel on behalf of God. The prophet said in Jeremiah 2.13, he says, my people have committed two sins. One, they have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and two, they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And what the prophet was saying was that Israel had forgotten God. They had outbusied their creator. They lived these lives independent of their creator God. And that's not God's plan. And instead of relying on God to be the well of their water that they get life from and their source, they were busy digging their own broken wells that essentially wouldn't hold up and would not hold water. And, and that's really the human condition, isn't it? We fail God by living without Him, and, then, and if that's not bad enough, we start digging our own way of life, our own counterfeit wells to find fulfillment, looking for love in all the wrong places, self-medicating, and, and all these false wells, they just can't hold water. And God, our loving Father, He sees that. And he comes to our aid, and he comes to rescue and to show us the way, the truth, and the life, because we're missing it. And, and because we rely on faulty water and life reservoirs, we become plastic in our witness, fake. Oftentimes, as Christ power, Christ witnesses, because we lack God's power. A Christ follower should have Christ power. It's that simple. And we lose our Christ-sized shine when we neglect our God relationship every day. And we start to try to rely on ourselves to fix our broken marriages, to fix things in our life, instead of really crying out to God. We think we can do it ourselves, And that's a breakdown in the system. Because as we unpacked last week, just like dishonest Romans back years ago in the market, um, they would temporarily fix the cracks in pottery and in water jars and, and in broken water jugs with, with a temporary wax. So that if, a, if a clay pot fell apart, they would get the pieces, they would put it back together using wax, kind of like glue, but it wasn't glue. And then they would put paint over it or, or some kind of veneer, and it would look good so people would buy it in the market thinking, oh, this is a great little water jug. And everything looked great until you put it over the fire to cook soup or water or boil water in. And then guess what would happen when the wax got too close to the flame? fall apart it would implode because it was not sincere in fact that's where we get the word sincere sin is means without in Sarah in the Latin wax and so when you went to the market you're looking for something that was sincere something that was without wax something that was authentic and not broken that's the word today in our language sin seer the word pictured really applies to us today doesn't it because it's like that our life, even as Christians sometimes, when we choose to live without Christ in an area of our life, we, we fail to make Christ the main thing in our life because we try to fix our cracks ourselves. We try to fix this crack with some smarts and intellect and the other one with some, some makeup, maybe but some others with a, a new truck or materialism or money or, or greed or, or whatever, maybe even some humor to fix up some of the cracks. And then we paint it really good with some superficial paint and say, oh, I'm good. Everything's good here, nothing to see. But the truth is we're not letting the Lord be the Lord of our life. He's the fixer. We have to trust him to do it. In essence, we become a bunch of cracked pots instead of a vessel of honor that God created for his purposes that God needs to fix so that we can truly hold his water, the living water of the Holy Spirit, and be a vessel that's poured into the lives of others. And that's God's plan for you and I. Which brings us this morning to a lady at the well who was pretty good at living the cracked pot lifestyle. If she had a minivan on the back of it, it said cracked pot life. That's just the way it was for her. Y'all can laugh at that. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> but that was the lifestyle that she was embracing, and, and everything was hunky-dory for her, although it was falling apart. And everything looked okay on the outside until Jesus showed up that day at the well to show her the way, the truth, and the life. From the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 19, and John 4, 25 and 26, and 39 and 42, I'm going to read this portion of Scripture that shares with us what it looks like to have an encounter with Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 1 says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees, or the religious leaders, had learned that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. 
although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and him who asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you the living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks the water here will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands, and the man you, you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. End quote. This is the word of God. Today we get through the lens of Scripture a biblical bird's eye view, a play-by-play, -play, if you will, of a day in the life of Jesus the Christ. This is what it was like, just one story among many. And, and due to time constraints this morning, we're only going to have time to pick out one central nugget that, that I really believe showcases and encapsulates God's heart. And it's right there at the beginning of this story. In verse 4, it says something really powerful about God. It says this, Now he, Jesus, had to go through Samaria. Now, what does this mean? Because we have to realize that everything is in the Bible for a reason. Everything is in Scripture for a purpose. It's not accidental. It's not a coincidence. God has a plan for everything. So when we don't understand something or something sticks out to us, we need to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, help me. Help me to understand this. And percolate in my brain and my soul and my spirit, Holy Spirit, God's truth, I pray. So what does it mean that, that Jesus had to go through Samaria? Because this is the only place in Scripture that I can remember where it said God had to do something. Jesus had to go through Samaria. Let's dig a little deeper for some cultural context and some biblical background here. Long story short, generally speaking, putting ourselves back in the sandals of those people in the day, uh, the Jews of Jesus' day abhorred the Samaritans. They didn't just not like them. They generally abhorred this people group. A lot of racism going on here. Even to the point of some Jews referring to the Samaritans as dogs or half-breeds. And, and if you look at this on a map, you see you've got Judea and you've got Galilee. And then right in between them, you've got Samaria. And so what some of the Jews would do is they wouldn't even go through Samaria, even though it was quicker. They would go around and circumvent. And this animosity, this is bad blood, this animosity stemmed from the division within Israel between the northern and the southern kingdoms of Israel in ancient times. As well as there was intermarrying that was strictly forbidden in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, like it says in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 3 through 5, and other places. And this intermarrying occurred between the Samaritans and their enemies, the Assyrians, that had captured that area. So they inbred with them. And the Assyrians were bad folks. In fact, they were so bad that oftentimes when the Assyrians would capture and kill a village, they would take the men and skin their bodies and nail the skins across the walls of their city. That's how evil the Assyrians were. Not to be too graphic, but that's what happened. History tells us. And so some of the Jews would 
intermarry, and they were the Samaritans. And, and all of this led to more than just a little hostility and bad blood between the Jews and the Samaritans to the point that many Jews circumvented or went around Samaria, like I mentioned a moment ago, when they were going from one place to another on this major travel route. But Jesus didn't. Our example, God Almighty with skin on, Jesus, he didn't avoid the Samaritans. In fact, he had to go through Samaria. He went headlong into the area, wholeheartedly. Why? Because a woman and her town needed saving. And not just any woman, but a woman, to be honest with you, in today's terms, that was considered loose, unrespectable, and at the bottom of the societal totem pole of the day. Because she had been married multiple times, and not including the man that she now lived with, whom she was not married to. And Jesus, he knew all about this lady even before the meeting at the well because, well, Jesus is God and he knows everything. And Jesus knew where and when to find this lady, which tells us something about this lady that maybe you don't know. And we find that out because of where and when the lady was at the well. Please let me explain. It says in the story that it was about noon in the middle of the day when Jesus came to the well and he was tired and thirsty and hot probably and, and we realize an ancient culture tells us and the scholars would tell us that there was a pecking order in this middle eastern village of the day in the life of Palestine and Jewish life back in the day and, and everybody knew this social pecking order especially the women and, and the townspeople who would gather at that very well because the well was the place to be in village life on a lot of levels. Uh, this place was the social networking village hub of village life. Before there was an internet, there was the well where everybody would go to and they would find out about life and what was going on. Town gossip, town news, this was the place because this is where everyone gathered. And where just in the world of village life, where did Jesus show up that day? Right at the well, at the epicenter of humanity. He did this to get the pulse of the city, to understand what was going on. And, and by the way, side note here, it's a freebie. Jesus knows just where to show up in your life to get your pulse, to see what matters to you. Amen? So we understand that it wasn't just the place to be for, for networking and to get the idea of what was going on in the town. But also in this context, as I shared last week from my time in India when I was in the jungle, I realized that if you don't have good water, you die. So it wasn't just something to be there sociologically for, but actually necessity would say, go to the well and get water. So everyone went there for getting water, for drinking, for cooking, for washing, for your clothes and everything. And, and all of this was the place to be. We have to realize that this is the place where Jesus would find you. And so all of this interaction at the well led to the cultural custom that the wealthier women of outstanding and more reputable character would be there early in the day to avoid the heat as they drew water for their households. And the leftovers would be left for the outcasts of the village who would have to contend for their water later in the day when it was hotter, harder, and certainly less convenient to draw water. So essentially, the time of day on the sundial would also tell you about how low the woman was on the respect and pecking order hierarchical scale of the town. It was very unfortunate because even the essential task of gathering water reminded this precious woman of her shame in the hottest part of the day where she was all alone, where not only did society look down on her, but the sun beat down on her which is just where Jesus found her that day, asking God with skin on for a drink, as he would ask her for that precious water and then in return offer her living water that would lead her and her town to Jesus Christ. So in closing today, as we pull back the biblical lens as we're looking at this movie that's unfolding before us in Scripture, what does God want you to see today? The Son of God had to go through Samaria on a divine rescue mission. 
a mission to save a human cracked pot. A valuable woman to God, discarded by the world who was looking for love in all the wrong places, like we've all done. Looking to find fulfillment to fill up these water jars, called her heart as she leaked all over the place that everyone saw, but she tried to keep quiet and to keep to herself, but everyone in the village saw. Her life was falling apart. It was crumbling under the heat of life and the struggle and tension of everyday existence. And that's where Jesus found her. In the middle of it all, Jesus found her. And in the middle of it all, she let herself be found by God. She let herself be found. She could have hardened her heart like she had done before. But instead, she surrendered and saved her and her village. She surrendered to God, which is lesson number one for becoming God-sized in your life. Find Jesus where he finds you. God is calling your name today, and you have a choice. You can let it go in one ear and out the other, or you can stop today and take advantage of the situation. Grab hold of the grace that has grabbed hold of you. And you can find God today. Your way, but his way, where they both collide. You know, and it makes me wonder how many people rubbed shoulders with Jesus when he was there at their village that day. Actually rubbed shoulders with God and didn't know it. They were more concerned about the chariot races this weekend or the, the, the melons that were on sale in the market. And they missed sight of God that was there with them. Jesus had to go through Samaria. Because God knew the exact intersection of this precious woman's come apart, and he met her there. God used her circumstances that she had gotten herself into to be the catalyst for change. It makes me also wonder, how many people has God put in your life for you to minister to, to show Christ to? I believe you're going to stand before God one day, each one of us in this room, and God's going to ask you, what did you do with what I gave you? People around you are your responsibility. Your brother, your sister, your friends, your mom, your dad, whoever's in your life, they're your responsibility for you to lead to Christ. And you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to get it all right. But you do have to show them Jesus. And you do that by partnering with the power of the Holy Spirit that's inside of you if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Will you let God change you today? Will you let him fill you with the Holy Spirit? You don't have to fix up, clean up, or even button up. You just have to let go of your life, this broken well, and let God fix it. Just let go and let God. He doesn't want you broken. He doesn't want you cracked. He didn't create you to be that way. He created you to be perfect in Him. And He's the only one that can make it happen. You can try a lot of different ways, but there's only one God. And you're going to stand before Him one day. Let God repair your heart with His salve, His medicine instead of your wax and your homemade concoction of you trying to do it yourself. Just come to him and surrender. Let us pray. God, we thank you for who you are. And we thank you that you came to seek and save the lost, Lord. That you love us with a love that's bigger than the sky and deeper than the ocean, Lord. It's the strongest and the sweetest thing, Lord. And you love us the best and you know us the best. And God, I pray, God, that we can let go of ourselves of trying to fix everything on our own of trying to be our own God, and we can yield to you and surrender these broken pieces so that you can make the most beautiful mosaic there ever was called our life. We ask you to come, Holy Spirit, and have your way. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. I'd like to invite you to stand as we close today. This is a, a time when we respond to God's word, and, and there's been miracles that have happened in this church. There was a miracle that happened last week here in worship. And, and, and if you need a miracle and you want a miracle, then just come forward and put your hands out. I'd be glad to pray with you. Or you can come and just pray and do business with the Lord at the altar yourself, whatever you want to do. Or maybe you want to give your life to Christ. I'd love to walk that out with you. You can just put your hands out, and that signifies to me that you'd like prayer. But nonetheless, come as the Lord leads you. God bless you.